Tractate Bhava Bhatra, page 150. Here we are, Long Island, New York. Thank you for all the people who not only present here so early in the morning, but also those who watch us, write us email and comments around the globe. The subject of a person's decision close to the end of his life it occupied the discussion today. Obviously, there are other indirect subjects such as prenuptial agreement. Don't think that it's something invented in the United States several years ago. It is invented in some ways in the era of the Talmud, and we're going to prove it today. The idea of movable property, what's involved, for example, a promissory note that's involved with documentation that has some debt or debt collection, is that part of the estate or what exactly the means of saying movable property, especially if a person did not say it in a very lucid, clear way. In the definition of movable property, how far you go, in those days they used to have Canaanite slaves, they used to have a milestone, part of that was attached to the ground, part of that not. So here we are, page 150, two lines from the Shurot Rechavot, from the long line of the Gemara. The Gemara said that these are languages that people use, such as a use of saying certain words that interpret it in certain way. Pshita metaltelili flanaya kol maneta shmishei kan elevar mechitei vesaarei. If person said, I'm giving my movable property to Mr. let's say Reuven, so then the idea is that that person acquire what? All utensils. But what do you mean all utensils? So here they said you have to differentiate between all utensils and wheat and barley. Let me share with you the word of the Rambam. In Chodzchiyahu Matana chapter 11, the Rambam said, if a person on his deathbed states that he gives his movable property to Mr. So-and-so, the recipient receives all of his utensils, but not his wheat and barley. The Sma, on the Shulchan Aruch Hoshen Mishpat, the 248, and you see also in the Be'er Ha'gra, the Ura Grader, he said that the recipient also does not acquire the giver's merchandise. So it all depends upon the expression. Furthermore, the Gemara said, um, uh, by the way, the Rashbam said that uh, the same applies to animals, behemoth, and the Adramah said all those other things that include the merchandise but did not spell it out as part of utensils. Um, the question is, what do you mean by utensils? So they said, So the big question is, the Rashbam said, what do you mean by saying a milestone? The Rambam elaborated and said, if he says all movable property shall be given to so-and-so, the recipient requires all, all of his movable property, including, so you see, the Canaanite slaves, which is in this case also considered a movable property, but is not acquired a lower milestone, which is a set in the ground. It's set in the ground, you cannot move it, the rabbi is explained, so therefore that's part of something that in a way is more permanent and is not a movable property. Now we ask a question, obviously you have to remember the historical context, which is the time of having slaves, especially in those days they have a Knanai slave. So they ask a question, is that a category of a slave is part of movable property or not. Um, when I studied it, I felt that those people who have a maid from different third world countries um, and sometimes um, people willing to give away their entire estate or put it in a trust account or give it to a trust attorney but they always separate to the maid, they're very attached to the maid um, sometimes it's even the animals, yes so they, in those, nowadays, so it happens that people categorize those in different. So in those days, since they have a, a Canaanite slaves, um, we can uh, juxtapose or understand the mindset. So they ask a question: Do you treat those Canaanite slaves as a movable property or not? How do you treat that? So the Rashbam elaborates and the Rashbam tells us It's for sure that we treated a slave the same as a property So obviously uh, the Torah derived, derived to us the word that's applied to any type of a um, 
a transaction that involved with money, with a uh, documentation, with the matter of Chazaka as well. But Lishon Bnei Adam, the language, the anthropomorphic language that people use on a daily basis, that's called movable property. That's kind of Chidush by the Rashbam. The Tosfot said a different way. They said, Le'inyan milei de Rabanan mi ba'aleha. So here we speak about the language of our sages. Here it's a Mishnah that we uh, learn on page 68, the uh, fourth parak, which means someone sold an estate but did not spell out what's involved with a selling the, they call it city in that sense. The big question is what do you mean by city? But let's go by literal sense that it just sold the city. So Shichinu Marot, Shichinu Marot is different type in those days they used to have it, um, uh, ditches, caves, etc. Merchatzaot, ubed abadin, ubed ashlachim, avalot amtaltelin. So all those entities that he sold, as we said, the bathhouse, the, the ditches, the caves, it's part of that olive presses that used to um, uh, irrigated field that used in those days, that's part not of the cell, and it's a, uh, um, 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 here they go and spell out, it said, but, lat, but not, avalo, metaltelin, it's not the movable property that within the domain of the city, ubizman shamar, However, if the seller spell out in the unambiguous, in a lucid, clear way, and he said, he vechol ma I'm selling the city, and whatever included within the domain of the city, afilo ayuba be'emao avadim arekulan mechuren, even it was there, and animals or slaves, it's all part of the sale, since he spell out within his utterance of his statement that included whatever they have in a city. So Rav Acha elaborated an explanation for this Mishnah, and he said as follows, If you tell me that this Knanai slave, we treated the entity of a slave the same as a movable property, that's the reason why we don't mention in the first clause of the Mishnah, because um, when a person just say the word, I'm selling the city without a clear expression, um, um, we only sell the estate itself, but not treated as slaves the same as movable property. But if you tell me that it's the same as a, a permanent state, land, what's the reason that the Knana slave uh, is not sold as part with the CD? Ravashi rejected that notion and he said, You mean to say that you treated that Knana slave the same as a movable property? My afilu, why the need to say in a Mishnah the word afilu, it's, um, it's like saying even Canaanite slave. You have to differentiate here between property that move by itself or property that not move by itself. If you tell me that it's treated as something that is a permanent land, you have to differentiate between a a state that you can move, that a state that does not move. So consequently, all this idea of legal status of Knan and slave cannot be proved from this a source of the Mishnah. So now here the Gemara tried to take a ev- different avenue to understand this quandary, this uh, dilemma, this unclear, ambiguous um, um, a predicament. Amar le Ravina le Ravashi Tashma. Here we bring a proof from a tracted Peah chapter 3, Mishnah number 8. Hakotev le Avdo kol nechasab. Someone write down to his um, um, slave, meaning he gives in a document, clear document, um, to his servant all of his property. It happens. You hear people even in the modern days that give to their maid. I heard even in Florida someone gave to a dog, but. Yes, um, I mean, I see the faces, but people write for the people who treated them nicely at the end of their life, above and beyond sometimes people's imagination. So anyway, the person wrote to his Knana, his slave, that he gives all his property. Yatsa ben Chorin, so that basically slave, he is uh, emancipated em- upon um, um, that shir kaka kol but he leave aside some estate, and as we explained yesterday and day before yesterday, some people does that, they just want to have a foundation for the rest of life that's left in this world to have some type of um, assurance of income or other reasons. But anyway, he left aside some estate, 
לא יצא בן חורין. If that's happened, the slave has not been emancipated because he reserved the slave for himself as well. רבי שמעון דיסגרי, רבי שמעון אומר לעולם הוא בן חורין. The slave in this circumstance, no matter what, he always become a free man regardless of the documentation, the working uh, words of the document, even if the owner reserve land for himself. Only the exception is if it was so clear by statement, if he said, all my estate is giving to so and so, but that's a statement with exclusion, that he put it in a way that it um, cannot be misconstrued by any means, but it's a spell out in the um, lucid way that's saying, except for one thousand of that entity. ואמר עבדי מבר יוסף אמר רבי אלעזר, עשו מתלמידים שיהיו אצל עבד. He says those movable property deem um, a, a reserving the property for oneself when it's come to this slave, because as we said, the slave is not emancipated when the owner gives him all the other property. However, ולא עשו מתלמידים שיהיו אצל כתובה, but when it's come to marriage contract, and as we said many times, the marriage contract is basically rabbinic, and because it's the structure of rabbinic rules, the rabbis can institute and the rabbis can basically uh, re, um, um, uh, abrogate it or expunge or, or change that structure since they are the people who make it. So the same way is that they enacted something, they can um, um, deactivate those decisions or change it. So therefore, when it's come to move with property, they did not deem that one withhold his sons um, um, and the um, earmark for his wife to be considered a significant uh, uh, reserving of property uh, when it's come to a marriage contract. What's the rational? What's the reason for that? He said, Avdak metaltalu, metaltala, metaltala vishiu. A slave is considering part of a movable property. And when it's come to movable property, um, uh, it's reserved, um, a, a, a woman marriage contract is document concerning land. When it's come to um, a movable property, is not considering a significant reserving with regard to land. So Rav Nachman states that a Eved Knani, Knanite slave, is considered a movable property. Now, we should know that um, there is a long explanation here of the Rashbam, and um, since we're short in time, so let's just turn the other side. 150b, אמר לי, ענן משום דלאו קרות גריטה מתניתה לה. So here, רב אשי said, when it's come to a freeing of a slave, you have to remember that because the עבד, um, the slave, considering, נחשב כקרקע, is considering like a estate, so he left for himself the metaltering, the movable property, but you have to have a total a cut, a lot of, a total, um, uh, uh, it's called crude guitar, to, uh, to have a star shichu, to have a release statement that you total um, a bill of admission that completely a, um, um, a severs the bond between the slave and the master. So that's the, the key. Amar Rav, Amar Rav Nachman, Chamisha, Ad Shechtevu Kol Nisem. Here, in very short, the Gemara uh, speak about um, way that the person transfers his estate. So you have here five category, which is someone who is in a deathbed, um, gift uh, to one Canaanite slave, gift to a wife, and uh, a gift to one sons, a gift to a woman who shelter her property from a prospective husband. So since we, we explain all of that. The first one, Shriv Meradetnan. This is what we learn, if you remember, page 146b. Shriv Meradetnan, kol nechasav l'achrim. If someone is in deathbed, that wrote his entire state to other per people. Vishir kalkar kol shur matan tokeem. We explain many times that we differentiate between situation that someone take the entire state and give it to someone else versus if he left something for himself. The moment he left something for himself, no matter what happened, it already belongs to other. Lo shir kol shur matan tokeem. If he didn't left anything and he gave the entire state to someone else, then if he get better, for example, he can get it back. Number two, Avdo Ditnan. This is Tractate Peah, Chapter 3, Mishnah 8. We just learned. So it's all dependent upon how he transferred to his servant, to his slave. If he left something, the servant is not free. Number three, Ishtol Amaravud Amoshmol. Kotev Kol Nechasav Lishtol Asa Al Apotropa. 
We explain that when it's come to inherit it between husband and wife, if it's not a gift, if it's a Yerusha, if it's inheritance, so he make it only the guardian, she cannot inherit him. We explained it at length in the past. Obviously, it's not the right time. Number four, Banav Ditnan. This is the Mishnah Tracted Peah, chapter three, Mishnah number seven. Hakotev kol nechasav levana vechatav lishto kargashu ibda kol tubta. If someone handed over right clearly, he's a state as inheritant to his sons, and he wrote for her a specific estate, she basically, as a result of that, lost the ktuba, meaning, in a way, it's almost like saying pick and choose. You want the money that get from the marriage contract or you want the estate. The moment you acquire, you have the estate as part of the, um, the, the gift, in a way, from person deathbed, that basically eliminates the, uh, the value of the money that committed in the ktuba. Number five, Mavrachat, Amarav Mavrachat, here is an example of prenuptial agreement that in a Talmudic time suggested indirectly. That's based on Gemara. We started in Tractate to what page 79. The idea is that um, a woman is about to marry. She has a lot of state. She's not so sure how the marriage is going to work out. So she basically wants to give one of her trustworthy friends the estate. But that's not a real giving. She wants just to have it in a secure place. So in case she divorce or she is widow, she remain the access and the capability of that estate. So she needs to stipulate it in a such a way that she will be protected. So again, we ask a question that's part of the discussion. How far you go with that? Um, if it was spelled out clearly, Rabbi Zera and Ado said, it's, it's make it in such a lucid way. So obviously it's her. If it's not, if it's ambiguous, sometimes is problematic. And anyway, when it's come to movable property, can be part of that kind of left aside. And he said, um, 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 reserving of a property, that all the older rabbinic enactment applies to a Mekarke, um, meaning a state. The, the Sages Institute uh, lien on the marriage contract in the, is placed on land, but when it's come to a movable property, the Sages did not institute that marriage contract can be collected from movable property. Amemba hold that the movable property that is explicitly written in the marriage contract um, is uh, as property for which the debt can be collected and it still extend and if the husband reserves the uh, property for himself this is considered a significant reserving of the property and his wife does not fulfill payment of her marriage contract. Amar Nechasai Leflanaya if person said my estate is going to Mr. So and so, Avdaikre Nechasai, his slave is considered part of his estate. If someone wrote his entire estate to his uh, st uh, uh, servant, Yatsaben <coughs> Horin, he is free. Ara Ikre Nechsed, Yatim Nechasim Shesh Lamachot, Yatim Bechazab Shtar Bechazaka. Estate is considering a basically property because we learn in Tractic Kiddushin, page 26. Property that serves as a guarantee for his, uh, such as land can be acquired by means of money, by means of deed, or by taking possession of it. So if you have glima nan, when it's come to clothes, it's also considering as a state, because we learn when they have no guarantee, the only way to acquire it is by pooling. Money, it's considering a property. So part of that is money. It's a good example of a large amount of money, this Reb uh, of Papa, and he chose for ownership of money to uh, another one who live in a place called Bey Chozai. He, he basically uh, transferred it to another one by um, doing a Kinyan Agav, which is the, by the threshold of his house. And therefore he can collect the money. So when he came back with the money, Rav Papa was so pleased that he went out as far as Tavich to meet him, and we learned it earlier. The next one is the Shtara. Shtara, it's uh, basically a, a deed. So th th that's basically part of what Gmar said, that is a, a continuation of what we learned in Tractic Kiddushin, page 26, that deed 
is part of Nechassim, part of the estate. The Marabah Bar Yitzchak Shnei Shtarotem. He holds the two types of deeds, and each of them is a different halacha. Amar Azachu Bezdeh Sorin Lefloni V'chidvu Li Tashtar Chozer B'shtar. If he said to two people, acquire the field on behalf of so and so, write the deed for him as a proof of the sale. The giver can retract the deed, but cannot retract the transfer of ownership of the field. The other property taking possession of it. But the other option, because the whole whole idea of Ma Sekin Yander Bashbam explained. Um, uh, was taking place, so therefore the one who gave her cannot change that um, decision, cannot abrogate that gift. But the other way is, if he said, um, But if he put a condition, and he said, that the, they write the deed for him, so the giver can retract both the deed and transfer the field, because he stipulated that the acquisition of the field is depend on the writing of the deed, that's a different story. So he hold that these are three different avenues for the uh, documentation that not received by the recipient and this type of the deeds. Two are those who stated before. The third option is if the seller wrote the deed in advance um, uh, and he basically hold it until the purchaser will come and pay it. So he said, this is exactly what we learn um, in the Mishnah that we are going to learn on page 167b, page 151, he, uh, the scribe by right deed of sale for the seller of the property, the seller request, even if the buyer is not with him when um, at the time he present this request, um, because the whole notion of the deed is obligates only the seller. And he said, That when it's come to this type of deeds, they can uh, uh, buy with the deeds that uh, have guarantee, with the deeds that doesn't have a guarantee. So, uh, so property does not uh, uh, serve as a guarantee. So it means, number one, that the shtarot, the documentation is called nechassim, nechassim. So if someone said nechassai leploni, I'm giving my estate to Mr. So-and-so, the shtarot, the deeds, it's basically included as part of the gift as well.